My name is Jameson Matas de Oca. Um, I'm an infectious diseases pharmacist at Norton Healthcare, and I'm located downtown at the Norton Hospital campus. Um, today's presentation for Grand Rounds is going to be vancomycin plus piperacillin tazobactam. Where do we stand in terms of the associated nephrotoxicity that we sometimes run into? So for our objectives, we are hoping to describe the historical association of nephrotoxicity between vancomycin and piperacillin and tazobactam, as well as identify methods to reduce the risk of nephrotoxicity when using vancomycin and piperacillin and tazobactam together. Now I have a clinical case here. I just wanna introduce it at this time. I don't need you guys to try to figure anything out, but I really just wanted to introduce a case because we're gonna to return to this later. Uh, but as I begin talking about some of the literature and kind of the historical perspective, as well as some clinical pearls regarding piperacillin, tazobactam, and vancomycin when used together. I just want you guys to think in the back of your mind of how uh, this case potentially could have been more optimized or a different, different strategies we could have employed when working up this patient. So a little background on piperacillin, tazobactam. So this is a broad beta-lactam uh, antibiotic that is commonly used across the, uh, across the world. It has strong streptococcal, uh, staphylococcal coverage, uh, with the exception of MRSA, as well as strong gram-negative and uh, anaerobic activity, um, with the important note having anti-pseudomonal activity. Um, as this drug does not, isn't known for being nephrotoxic alone, it does have uh, a very rare side effect to cause what's called acute interstitial nephritis, or AIN, um, which can then result in AKI or acute kidney injury or nephrotoxicity. Um, however, this is very rare, um, and it's not necessarily something you should be uh, considering when uh, wanting to give this drug. Um, and this AIN, as I said, it's very rare. It's kind of this, uh, not your typical reaction. It's uh, more allergic in nature. Um, an additional uh, pearl about this medication is it does inhibit tubular secretion of creatinine, um, which can sometimes lead to a pseudo elevation. So typically when we're looking uh, at creatinine clearance or kidney function, sometimes we'll use creatinine or BUN as a surrogate marker for, creatin for uh, kidney function. Um, so this can sometimes artificially elevate it. It's not actually causing any kidney damage per se. It is just inhibiting some of the tubular secretion of creatinine, which is artificially going to elevate the serum levels. Now for vancomycin, this is a first-line therapy for MRSA coverage. Uh, when I say MRSA, I mean methicillin resistant staphylococcal, staphylococcus aureus. Um, and it's pretty much the powerhouse of many hospitals' gram positives or gram positive antibiotics. Um, conversely to piperacillin and tazobactam, this drug is widely known to be nephrotoxic, um, a reversible nephrotoxicity, uh, with incidence anywhere from 5% to well over 60, depending on what literature and source you review. Um, it's hard to say what exactly the relationship is in terms of incidence, but we do understand that it is known to be nephrotoxic uh, when given in too much amounts, and it's typically exposure related. Um, and it's generally accepted that this drug has variable, variable uh, instance of nephrotoxicity depending on the patients. Some people are gonna be a very highly prone to getting vancomycin related nephrotoxicity, whereas others are not gonna be as uh, prone for developing a nephrotoxicity or an acute kidney injury. And on the topic of vancomycin resistant, or vancomycin uh, risk factors for nephrotoxicity, this has been evaluated in previous studies. Um, of the first few that we'll discuss briefly, um, we have trough levels over 20 milligrams per liter, doses of greater than four grams per day, and then extended durations typically over seven days. Now, these are all similarly related in the fact that they're mostly the drug itself. So uh, when I say trough values, for those who are unaware, so vancomycin being a nephrotoxic drug, uh, we want to uh, monitor how much drug is in the body uh, so we can anticipate or uh, try to prevent any form of AKI or nephrotoxicity. Um, we will typically draw trough values. So we'll draw a level from the blood and try to measure how much vancomycin is in there at that period of time, right before we give the next dose. So essentially, it's our surrogate marker trying to say, uh, what is the lowest possible amount of vancomycin that's in the body since we're taking it right before the next dose, since your body should have cleared most of it by then. Um, so when you have trough values greater than 20, this is typically when you have uh, an increased risk of nephrotoxicity. To put this in perspective, uh, depending on the indication, uh, in trough value or trough goals are anywhere from 10 to 20 or 15 to 20, depending on the indication as per their most recent guidelines. Um, however, being 15 to 20 is still close to that 20. This may require some additional consideration down the road and may need a revamping of the vancomycin uh, 
uh, vancomycin uh, dosing guidelines in the future. Um, for doses greater than four grams per day, this is kind of related to uh, increased weight, which I don't have listed here, but patients who are of uh, increased weight, generally over 100 kilos or 110 kilos, are at more risk to uh, developing AKI or nephrotoxicity from vancomycin therapy. And that's just because this drug is a weight-based dosing. Um, so if you're increased weight, you're going to have an increased dose. And we do try to cap the, the individual doses at two grams per dose. Um, and then duration, this is again going with exposure. The longer you're on the drug, the more you potentially have risk for accumulating the drug and developing uh, uh, developing nephrotoxicity. Now for a couple other ones on the far side is a history of renal disease. Now this may feel intuitive, but if you have a historical uh, chronic kidney disease or even a history of acute kidney injury or nephrotoxicity from really any etiology, you are at increased risk for developing a vancomycin related nephrotoxicity. Um, and then as well as the severity of illness, so patients presenting to the ICU or presenting requiring vasopressors uh, ventilation or just high acuity of illness are at increased risk for developing nephrotoxicity. This has to do with a variety of factors, including changes in the volume of distribution, uh, as well as just your body's normal reaction or response to sepsis and kind of shunting blood to different parts of the body. And typically the kidneys can sometimes be uh, neglected in this scenario. And the body's defense mechanism is to force blood towards the heart, brain, and other vital organs. And then lastly, concomitant nephrotoxic drugs. Um, as you might have guessed, vancomycin nephrotoxicity may be exacerbated by other drugs. So an example of this would be an aminoglycoside, which is uh, historically commonly given alongside vancomycin um, in the late 90s, or sorry, late 20th century. Um, and as you may or may not know, aminoglycosides are extremely nephrotoxic. Um, in fact, they can increase the nephrotoxic rate by three to four fold. So why do we have such fear with piperacil and tazobactam and vancomycin together? Um, as I just mentioned, piperacillin is pretty safe for the kidneys, uh, with the exception of the AIN, which isn't really a, uh, a consideration we would uh, think about when trying to start this drug. But we do know vancomycin, is, uh, it does have a propensity to be nephrotoxic. Um, so when using this in a combination, what has happened in the past uh, 12 years or so that's made many providers shy away from this, this regimen or take it with a grain of salt and potentially use something more broad as the beta-lactam backbone? Um, because this has been evaluated in the literature in terms of uh, development of AKI with combination therapy compared to vancomycin alone, as well as any possible pathophysiological reason as why these two drugs could have a synergistic effect. And there actually hasn't been any study that could pinpoint an exact mechanism as to why piperacillin and vancomycin together cause a synergistic nephrotoxicity, whereas piperacillin, tazobactam alone, uh, does not have anything. Um, so that's actually what we're going to look into now. Um, and we're actually going to start out with it, two abstracts that came out in 2011. Um, this is actually the original, uh, the original two abstracts were published in Critical Care Med in 2011. Um, prior to this event, there really wasn't any documentation of this. These drugs have been around um, for quite some time. I think Piperacillin and Tazobactam was uh, FDA approved in the late 80s, and Vancomycin was well before then. So they have been used in combination for over uh, decades uh, without any published incidents of these, uh, these, these uh, incidents of nephrotoxicity when used together. And when I say nephrotoxicity when used together, a worsened nephrotoxicity compared to vancomycin alone. But these two abstracts kind of founded the, the initial um, steps that kind of led to a cascade of research and publications that kind of investigate and try to find the answer to this question. Um, and as you can see, th these were they weren't by any means robust studies. They were retrospective works. Um, but you can see some similarities and differences between them. And the point of this, this presentation isn't to critically assess by any means any of the literature we're going through. We're maybe taking a little more of a superficial approach and kind of highlight some of the more important aspects. But um, these studies were a little bit different, but you will notice that some of their outcomes um, did support that. Uh, on, on the left, the uh, study by Helwig and colleagues, uh, piperacillin and tazobactam did have an increased rate of uh, acute renal failure. Uh, compared to vancomycin alone. However, they did not see this in the ICU population or the critically ill population. Whereas on the other side, when we have men and colleagues did, uh, saw that the uh, use of vanco and uh, piperacillin and tazobactam um, uh, did have uh, a higher incidence of acute kidney injury. And it's important to note that they have different uh, definitions of nephrotoxicity or AKI. And that's kind of a common theme that we're going to see throughout some of this literature we'll talk about. No one study necessarily has the same definitions or they might call it something else 
Um, so a lot of times when we're taking it, we're, we're critiquing, critiquing these publications, um, there is some heterogeneity in terms of the methods and definitions. Um, so as I mentioned, there was a cascade of retrospective research that occurred after this event. So as you can see in 2010, right before uh, the publication of these two articles or abstracts, I should say, um, really wasn't much out there. Um, if you look on PubMed and kind of play around with the uh, the keywords of piperacillin, tazobactam, vancomycin, nephrotoxicity, um, you'll see that the graph kind of becomes very explosive after the publication of these re results, and it still has continued to this day. In fact, it's become pretty uncommon for a pharmacy residency to not investigate this on a on an annual project. Um, but as we could, we don't have time to go through every single article that's been published, but as you can see, various things, various. Uh, iterations of the same research question have been uh, examined in, across different populations, as well as some of the other drugs trying to investigate other reasons as to why this combination of vancomycin plus piperacil and tazobactam might be nef nephrotoxic in nature. Um, so I, over, as I mentioned, we're not going into a deep dive, but kind of on a superficial level, trying to summarize this in the most concise way of what this literature found is when we examine vancomycin uh, compared to vancomycin plus piperacil and tazobactam, as a combination, the frequency of nephrotoxicity or AKI was elevated or increased the risk, a uh, significant risk uh, when given vancomycin plus piperacillin and tazobactam. Um, even when we had some a couple of systematic reviews that investigated this question and attempted to confound for certain factors and look at subgroup analyses, um, they still found the, the, uh, the significance there for most populations. Um, it is important to note a lot of the limitations of these. I will briefly discuss them. As I mentioned, the heterogene heterogeneity in the data, uh, some of the, the uh, studies included had a wide variability in terms of definitions, patient populations uh, such as ICU level patients versus uh, standard floor level patients, um, various inclusion criteria, definitions of AKI. Um, most of them were a lot of small studies and all of these were retrospective in nature for the most part. Um, so it's kind of makes it a little bit hard to make full conclusions, but at the end of the day, all the fingers are pointing towards that, for the most part, vancomycin plus piperacillin and tazobactam um, does lead to more AKI or nephrotoxicity, depending on the uh, verbiage or uh, definition that you want to use. So with this information, it kind of led to providers trying to mitigate this AKI, because obviously we don't want our patients to develop a nephrotoxicity or AKI, so kind of just reasonable um, uh, reactions that we can have to this is potentially avoid the combination, which of course makes sense at the surface level. So maybe this is select a different gram positive agent, omit the vancomycin, keep the piperacillin and tazobactam component, and see if that changes any incidence of AKI, or the opposite, where we keep the vancomycin, uh, but kind of omit the piperacillin and tazobactam and use an additional drug such as cefepim or meropenem as the beta-lactam backbone. And this has actually been examined. Um, so let's try, let's see what the literature says about when we try to avoid vancomycin. Um, so this is actually being examined in a prospective randomly controlled trial, uh, which is kind of different from most of the other studies that included that were included in these retrospect in this uh, uh, systematic review. So this was a, a prospective trial that looked at instead of using vancomycin plus piperacillin and tazobactam, let's compare that to uh, switching early to a less nephrotoxic antimicrobial antimicrobial such as linazolid, um, ceftaroline, daptomycin. And examine the incidence of nephrotoxicity with this regimen compared to the piperacillin and tazobactam, um, or sorry, in, uh, compared to the patients receiving vancomycin. So in this study, this was a prospective, really prospective randomized controlled trial. It was a single-centered study, and it has sample size of 103. Uh, the primary outcome was nephrotoxicity. Uh, secondary outcome was a modified AKI definition. As I mentioned earlier in the systematic reviews and retrospective works, uh, there was a lot of heterogeneity in terms of like definitions and what you constitute as AKI or what you constitute as nephrotoxicity. So this study attempted to answer some of the questions or attempt to account for some of those discordance definitions by having two different uh, outcomes in it. So the primary outcome nephrotoxicity used as a serum creatinine uh, change of 0.5 or greater uh, or 0.5 or greater or a 50% change. Um, with two with repeat lab values, whereas the modified AKI definition they used uh, was a change in at least 0 0.3 uh, milligrams per deciliter of serum creatinine, um, or a reduction in the creatinine clearance of at least 50%, or any change in urine output that was uh, considered uh, significant. So for the nephrotoxicity and modified AKI definitions that they used, for their outcomes, they did not find any statistical, statistical difference between the two therapies. 
Um, so it really, so from this type of takeaway really was that vancomycin may or not be the influential factor here. These patients all developed AKI at a relatively similar rate um, or nephrotoxicity depending on the outcome we're discussing. So there was no statistical difference between patients that received uh, vancomycin sparing therapy versus a vancomycin therapy itself. So our takeaway here is potentially there's some alternative strategy that we can involve or employ, uh, such as an enhanced monitoring of the patients at risk. Since based on this perspective piece, these patients uh, are likely going to develop AKI regardless of what treatment we give them. So on the other side, so we looked at the omitting vincomycin. What about when we omit uh, piperacillin and tazobactam and use cefepime or meripenem or another broad-spectrum beta-lactam as our beta-lactam backbone? And this has actually been evaluated in those same systematic reviews and some of the same uh, studies that looked at vincomycin plus piperacillin and tazobactam. Um, they did look at like vincomycin cefepime or vincomycin meripenem versus vincomycin plus piptazo. And they did, it was significant for uh, piperacillin and tazobactam plus vancomycin for being more nephrotoxic than the piperacillin and tazobactam sparing regimen. Um, however, it's not entirely true across all patient populations, um, specifically in the critically ill populations. Using cefepime or meropenem in place of piptazo, piperacillin and tazobactam uh, did not result in any statistical difference in terms of the incidence of AKI. Um, regardless, as a um, as a response to some of this data that's supported that cefepime or meropenem may be a AKI sparing regimen, has pushed some of the providers to try to avoid using vancomycin plus piperacillin tazobactam and kind of pursue vancomycin plus cefepime or vancomycin plus meropenem as kind of an empiric approach to approaching patients with suspected sepsis, um, septic shock, or any form of uh, infectious indication warranting broad spectrum coverage. Um, but as you can see, as from a stewardship perspective, using meropenem as a empiric option uh, may not necessarily be the most appropriate uh, option, especially when you look at anti-biogram anti data. Um, we know that use of meropenem or just carbapenem in general is going to breed resistance and breed CRE. So from an inspection for infection prevention standpoint, it's very harmful for the, the health system or the hospital uh, in terms of patient safety as well. So at the end of the day, is this a reasonable solution? Is using cefepime or piptazo uh, reasonable? And so let's look at a table and kind of assess what we do now. So we do see that the literature does support, generally speaking, vancomycin plus piperacillin and tazobactam as being more nephrotoxic than uh, vancomycin alone. Um, so it's, there is a substantial data supporting us. Um, but do we, not, we do not have any definitive mechanism or rationale as to what is causing this when used together. We know vancomycin is nephrotoxic alone. We know that piperacillin and tazobactam is not nephrotoxic alone. However, when together, we haven't been able to identify any mechanism that is the reason why all of a sudden we get a synergistic nephrotoxicity. So this is going to be an X. Um, when we looked at alternatives to vancomycin to negate AKI, we didn't see anything. This was the, uh, the, the perspective trial, the stop NT trial, um, and we didn't see any different statistical difference in terms of incidence of AKI or nephrotoxicity. Um, and now what we just discussed, using alternative to piperacillin and tazobactam, such as cefepime, meropenem, uh, in place of piperacillin and tazobactam, we got mixed results. Sometimes it, it showed a benefit uh, to reduce AKI. Sometimes it did not, especially those ICU populations. Um, so a possible conclusion that we could come up with is that many of these patients have risk factors that predispose them to acute kidney injury or nephrotoxicity, regardless of what we give them, um, whether it's vancomycin plus piperacillin and tazobactam or vancomycin plus cefepime. Um, and honestly, we should be focusing more of our efforts towards uh, improving stewardship measures and to reduce unnecessary vancomycin usage and kind of screening patients at, uh, at the beginning and kind of assessing their risk for uh, vancomycin, or sorry, uh, assessing their risk for um, developing a development of AKI or nephrotoxicity. So I want to bring back to this slide um, where we kind of had our, our list of six known risk factors for developing nephrotoxicity on vancomycin. Um, so what we should really be doing here is, as I mentioned on the previous slide, is really improving our assessment. So really looking at the patients from the start and keep looking at them and monitoring them uh, and assess them for their development of AKI or nephrotoxicity. And when we take these into account on our patients, it's possible that we can mitigate more AKI or nephrotoxicity um, and try to improve our patient outcomes. So how do we do this exactly? Uh, so from a patient perspective, we can look at the appropriateness of impaired combination. We can assess the risk factors for those six that I just mentioned, as well as try to limit the exposure of vancomycin or combination therapy. Um, we can do this on the patient level as well as on a stewardship 
or a, a large scale level that I'll briefly talk about on the next few slides. So getting to more pearls or um, specifics regarding the patient assessment. Um, the first thing that we can do to help mitigate AKI is kind of identify, try to think back of what AKI is or nephrotoxicity is and how it develops. So we have these patients with critical illness um, presenting to the, e the emergency room um, requiring high, um, high volume of O2 or oxygen. Uh, and these patients potentially, if they're in critically ill and septic shops, it's possibly they're already in AKI or the, the, uh, they're going to develop an AKI regardless of what happens to them, um, just as the body's natural response. Um, in addition, in terms of the pathophysiology of acute kidney injury, um, this may not be apparent on lab values alone. So you may get this patient who's critically ill in the emergency department, draw some labs, and that creatinine might be normal, uh, mildly elevated, but not really nothing that you would be overly concerned for. But the fact of the matter is that creatinine is a lagging factor. So if you were to get a creatinine or a BUN or any of those surrogate markers for clearance that you can get from a laboratory value, um, they're not actually going to represent the true nature of the kidneys, the, the kidney function. Um, if there is a lag anywhere from 24 hours, 48 hours uh, that takes for these labs to actually change. So this patient may seem that they do not have any acute kidney injury based on creatinine or BUN, uh, but it's entirely possible that they are already in an acute kidney injury. Um, a second factor is looking at our patient size. So I mentioned the dose is going to be important when it comes to uh, risk stratification. So we have a large patient, 100 kilograms, 110 kilograms, 120 kilograms. Those larger patients are going to acquire larger doses of vancomycin, so they might be approaching that four grams per day. Um, so just there's various things that we can take into consideration and combined with our previous um, bullet points of patients that might already be in an AKI, we might not want to put them on four grams a day right at the start as their kidney function is already de uh, deteriorating despite us being unable to detect it with, tip, with uh, standard laboratory assessment. Um, and then for these next two are actually similarly related. Um, this is referring to more empiric approach. So not all patients actually require vancomycin and picrosol and tazobactam, and not all indications require uh, such broad coverage. Um, so if we can limit the general exposure to vancomycin, piperacillin, and tazobactam, um, that is another way we can help mitigate some of this risk. So if you're not going to give the drug, it kind of negates a lot of the potential drug-associated nephrotoxicity. So there's a good example of the second, uh, or sorry, the, the fourth bullet point, or the second one I'm just describing now, is patients being started on vancomycin, piperacillin, and tazobactam um, for a cellulitis, and upon like reviewing the clinical photographs and patient presentation, um, having hemodynamic stability, and there's no... Um, imminent threat of patient deterioration, um, this may not be the most appropriate empiric regimen for this patient, whereas a uh, much simpler uh, uh, empiric selection of cefacillin might be uh, more than appropriate to cover this cellulitis. And we can actually save this patient both vancomycin and piperacillin and tazobactam and kind of negate a lot of the nephrotoxicity associated with both. And then lastly is follow up with microbiology and de-escalate um, and ideally discontinue uh, to limit the duration and exposure of vancomycin, as all of these are related to um, developing uh, acute kidney injury or nephrotoxicity. And if we apply these all these ideas, as well as some more from the system level stewardship, um, we can help mitigate these risk factors on the individual level. Um, and when we are looking at this, we can help, we have identified all six of these, these threats when it comes to vancomycin and nephrotoxicity. And on the next slide, we're actually going to discuss some of the system level approaches that we can take to help improve our um, risk assessment and risk gratification and trying to reduce the incidence of uh, vancomycin, piperacillin, tazobactam associated nephrotoxicity, or just vancomycin nephrotoxicity in general. Um, and some of the stuff that we can do for this is implementation of standardized stewardship policies and protocols. Um, if we can get everyone on the same page and make some uniformity, it's going to be a lot easier for us to have discussions with providers, discussions with other members of the healthcare team to help uh, improve the patient's uh, inpatient antimicrobial regimen. Um, and enforce a cooperation cooperation with the interdisciplinary team is key. This is going to be everywhere from nursing, infection prevention, uh, to physici physician champions, and to pharmacy of, as well. Now, for specifics on the system level of how we can adopt stewardship practices to improve uh, mitigating AKI, in general, vancomycin exposure, um, there's a variety of things that we can do. I've got six listed here that I'll go through briefly, uh, but there are much more that I could not fit on one slide or have uh, time to discuss. But starting at the top of suggested impure and microbial policy. So coming up with a policy or a protocol um, to help guide empiric selection is a great way to help uh, reduce the amount of vancomycin used as well as piperacillin and tazobactam and kind of improve the, this, the uniformity of what 
what antimicrobials we're using. And kind of how we start to do this is starting out with an antibiogram data, um, kind of looking at your susceptibility rates for various organisms and uh, incidents of certain infections, try to determine what antibiotic you think is the most effective or uh, what antibiotic is going to be the most appropriate uh, for an indication as well as an organism itself. Um, and this is also a help limit concomitant nephrotoxicity. So historically, vancomycin, piperacillin, tazobactam, plus an aminoglycoside um, or plus ciprofloxacin um, as another example, which isn't necessarily as nephrotoxic uh, as, as the vancomycin or aminoglycoside, but those were commonly used and can kind of exacerbate a lot of adverse drug events. So if we can limit our concomitant nephrotoxic exposure with aminoglycosides, maybe just a single dose during sepsis, or really just be stewards of using concomitant, medica concomitant nephrotoxic medications, we can really reduce the incidence of AKI. Um, the next one is going to be vancomycin dosing protocol. And again, this is another attempt to standardize practice. Um, allows for uniformity to inform, inform those involved in the dosing process of vancomycin, which is typically um, delegated to a pharmacy, uh, to a pharmacy personnel as a, a pharmacist or clinical pharmacist. Um, have them empowered, give them information and a document that kind of is tells them what you should be assessing for, what risk factors to be looking for when dosing this medication, as well as following up when you're uh, reviewing a level to help uh, identify potential um, developing AKI and kind of essentially empower these pharmacists to give them a, for a foresight uh, to, to anticipate um, a potential AKI or nephrotoxicity depending on the patient's day-to-day -day change. And then for the de early de-escalation policy, this is another avenue that uh, many health systems can uh, pursue, and essentially a way to reduce the um, exposure to vancomycin. So it may be uh, we have started on vancomycin, blood cultures are um, identified as gram positive, uh, and then we continue vancomycin as it's appropriate in this case, but when we find out that it's streptococcus that's growing. Um, although vancomycin appropriately covers streptococcus for the most part, uh, we can don't necessarily need to use vancomycin or such a broad agent that's really only designed um, to be used for MRSA infections. So if we can cut down and de-escalate early um, using microbiology inf microbiologic information, we can limit our exposure and duration of vancomycin. And similarly related to MRSA is, our, is developing an MRSA treatment guideline or an MRSA management guideline, which is essentially a document that can inform uh, providers, pharmacists, nursing, of what are the generally accepted principles of how to go about um, treating an MRSA infection, whether that's a, a MRSA pneumonia or an MRSA uh, bacteremia or endocarditis, and what, pro what we should be using to optimize this drug therapy, as well as to help reduce the occurrence of nephrotoxicity associated from the, the uh, vancomycin. Another one is to use MRSA screening protocols. So this is essentially using a PCR uh, a uh, a PCR test to essentially, when a patient gets admitted, uh, you screen their, their nares and identify uh, the presence of staph aureus or not. And there's actually been studies that associate with very high probability of negative test results indicating that there's a very high likelihood that the organism um, that might be causing a pneumonia in that patient is not MRSA. If it's not MRSA, we don't really have a need to use uh, vancomycin. We can get away with using uh, just a beta-lactam alone um, and cover for our, our uh, organisms that are typically responsible for pneumonia. Um, and an additional way we can apply this is uh, when patient, or another way to apply this is uh, having this order, this MRSA Nares PCR link to whenever a provider wishes to order vancomycin for a respiratory etiology infection with a respiratory etiology um, kind of automatically come with the order. So when the patient gets the, the vancomycin order, they also have an order for the Nares and help uh, kind of in the same way of early de-escalation, kind of hopefully be able to stop the vancomycin if it's not needed or identify if it is needed. And then lastly, uh, microbiology rapid diagnostics um, becomes a little bit more advanced, but this is uh, where we can get uh, information ahead of culturing. So typically when we're culturing, trying to identify what is the organism at play, we can see uh, ahead of the culture within hours of like, is a resistance gene for MRSA detected? Are we detecting the MECA gene that's responsible for uh, beta-lactam resistance in staph aureus? So that's another way we can employ, uh, another way we can employ uh, stewardship policies to help reduce vancomycin exposure and ideally reduce uh, AKI associated with vancomycin. And how we keep these up is just continue doing education. So our providers or, and other new personnel that get hired, uh, continue education with these, these individuals, as well as continuing your own education, going to conferences, and staying up to date with guidelines can help uh, keep these standardized practices in order and keep 
them operating at the intent that they are meant to be. So now when we return to our patient case, um, based on what we discussed about risk factors, we can kind of see a few things right off the bat that we might be able to consider uh, if next time when this patient, uh, a similar patient presented, we might be able to find a different way to go about this, this, uh, this uh, recommendation to use vancomycin and meropenem. So when we look at the patient's age, weight, and history of CKD, um, we kind of see that this patient is probably at increased risk right at the bat for being uh, for developing an AKI or nephrotoxicity. Um, it's also very likely that they are in an AKI, although it can't be detected right now by a creatinine. Um, they have an elevated, or they have a uh, history of CKD, and they're also already on pressor. So this phenylephrine is actually going to sh uh, shunt blood away from the kidneys, um, force it to the brain, um, clamp down on all the blood vessels in the body. So it's likely that this patient is going to develop an AKI um, very soon, if not already. Um, and then vancomycin using vancomycin in combination with meropenem, um, just to be uh, cognizant of everyone's time, since we are running a little bit over 30 minutes, uh, meropenem. Uh, might not be the most appropriate picture here. Um, this, pay, this provider may have seen some of the data regarding vancomycin and piperacillin and tazobactam in the incidence of AKI, but this patient's likely already in an AKI or is going to develop one. Um, and I don't believe that the piperacillin is going to add any increased risk at this point. Um, and kind of going to such an, something so broad as meropenem as a sympheric approach, for someone who doesn't really have any microbi microbiology history, um, except for MRSA growth, uh, is kind of unwarranted. So in the general perspective of looking at this patient from an empiric selection, um, using piperacillin and tazobactam would be very much appropriate in this case in combination with vancomycin. Um, this could be helped mitigated by some of the system-wide stewardship approaches, um, such as the empiric, gui empiric uh, uh, antibiotic recommendation guideline, um, as well as like early de-escalation de guidelines to help mitigate potential AKI development in this patient or similar patients. Um, so for the main points, um, by applying our antimicrobial stewardship principles on the patient system levels, the combination should only be used when there is an indication and should be reviewed on an ongoing basis. Um, if the combination is indicated, it should be kept at the minimum required duration and with an increased awareness for development of AKI or presentation with AKI and kind of mitigating those risk factors associated with AKI when, when in common, uh, those risk factors for developing AKI for vancomycin therapy and vancomycin plus piperacillin and tazobactam. Um, and the really big takeaway is that, you know, despite all this data that, and all this flack that suggests that piperacillin plus vancomycin, piperacillin tazobactam plus vancomycin is associated with more nephrotoxicity, there's likely these other uh, processes going on that are really the driving force, especially vancomycin itself, which is known to be nephrotoxic. Um, and based on that in, that information, I would really recommend that the use of vancomycin and piperacillin and tazobactam can still be an appropriate empiric regimen in some patients. It should not be cast away and avoided for everyone. Um, and at this point, I'd like to field any questions you may you all may have. Thank you so much. That was that was excellent. So it you know in listening to your to your uh, presentation, I'm just struck with you know the again the it underscores the importance of antimicrobial stewardship programs in every setting where you know you are going to be administering antibiotics, especially problematic antibiotics and problematic you know, combinations. So your approach, you described an approach that, you know, that is very much in need of, of this, this specialty approach. How, do you have some thoughts about, and, and maybe just, you know, kind of summarize some, some of the, the to-do list for if, if individuals are working in a facility where they don't have the, the, the access to clinical pharmacists, especially clinical pharmacists with with um, a lot of ID background, what are some steps that they may take in uh, as they begin to think about it? You know how to manage these types of situations and and prevent them. Yeah, so um, one of the first stuff is kind of just going back to you know the assessment of risk factors for developing nephrotoxicity or AKI, whichever um, verbiage you'd like to use. Um, it's really to see those patients that may potentially you know look at their age, their weights. Um, what is their current conditions that they're presenting with? So kind of I mentioned if someone's presenting critically ill, um, even in requiring like vasopressors right at the start, that patient's already in a septic shock slash like sepsis um, uh, reaction. His body's already going to be shunting blood away from the kidneys from a physiological uh, perspective. So these kidneys are already going to be likely in an AKI state or nephrotoxic state um, pretty much at time zero. 
uh, whenever this, this patient presented, despite any laboratory measures. So really the recommendation is to not always trust your laboratory measures. So you might suspect this patient might be in an AKI based on the presentation, but you take a uh, serum creatinine or a serum BUN, it says it looks normal. So you're like, oh, this person's fine. I'm going to put them on a, a vancomycin, percocillin, tazobactam, or vancomycin plus whatever um, at large doses, high frequencies. Um, but that's not necessarily the most appropriate route because this patient, um, just speaking anecdotally, as well as just based on the literature itself, these, these patients are already in an AKI and, you know, giving them those massive doses is really going to expand their exposure to the vancomycin, um, which is really likely the driving force of most of this AKI that we see. So it's really just trying to enhance our assessment of our patients on time zero, as well as following up on them uh, throughout their stay as trying to doing our best to try to limit how much exposure they get to some of these antimicrobials, namely vancomycin. Excellent. Very good. Any questions from anybody else on the on the call? Uh, yeah. Hey, uh, this is uh, Matt Song here. Uh, hey, Jameson. Um, I, I like that you mentioned the um, like. I like I like the little graphic you had from PubMed talking about the uh, the, the the literature that has come out on this particular topic. It's it's interesting to me that most of it wasn't identified really until two thousand eleven. I was curious what your thoughts were on, on why that was. Why have you not provided a lot of information on this particular issue in maybe like the 90s or the 2000s, 90s, 80s, et cetera? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, to, to be frank, I'm not too sure why it wasn't uh, really investigated or documented as well as, as it did in, since the 2011 uh, abstracts. Because as I, I think I mentioned during the presentation, um, the two drugs have been, in, you know, I think Hipperson and Tazobactam was FDA approved in the late 80s, maybe early 90s. So uh, it's been pretty much a gram negative anti pseudomonal backbone uh, for over two decades before that those two studies came out. So I actually do, I'm not too sure as to why um, all of a sudden they kind of had this explosion of, uh, or I shouldn't say explosion, but uh, all of a sudden these these uh, these two independent uh, hospitals or health systems kind of investigated this and kind of led to the explosion. Um, uh, do you have any insights? Uh, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I, my theories are so. I guess um, the, the number one theory I have about it is that uh, in 2009 is when the bank dosing guidelines came out that started to routinely recommend higher troughs. Uh, and then, so, you know, allowing some time for practice to change and then discover this change in outcomes and then provide literature on it. So that's really what I thought has been like the, like the inciting thing about it. The other thing is um, I think about the increased use of like a broad spectrum combination like Pictazo and Bank. Um, and then you know, it's a little bit before, but it's getting to about the time where there was increasing focuses on sepsis and the idea that, okay, time is tissue and we have to go very broad, very early. Um, and so I, I thought that that might've contributed as well, but that, you know, that, that, that timeline doesn't match up as good, but, um, but those, those have always been my theories. Yeah. And it might also have something to do with maybe the uh, kind of the more expansion of using paper charts um, and just the internet and being able to like do more robust research and a lot of more retrospective research um, that wasn't really you know feasible uh, in the late 80s, 90s, and even the early 2000s. A lot of health systems are still to this day kind of just now transitioning to electronic medical records. So trying to do retrospective pieces, looking at AKI associated with these two drugs um, is more just like a logistical nightmare trying to sift through patient charts, whereas a lot of times things aren't really going to be documented as well. Um, and there wasn't nearly as a, uh, as sensitive or specific labs at the time. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, you, you know, you don't find a problem unless you look for it. If it's easier to look for it, you, you start finding a bunch of problems, huh? <laughs> well, I put information in the chat. I know that, you know, this again, underscores the importance of antimicrobial stewardship programs and, you know, everybody starts at different places and is at different places and, in this journey. So I put Chelsea Song's email in the chat if people are interested in, in um, having somebody reach out to them about some of these stewardship activities, learn more about what is happening, please uh, email Chelsea and she can uh, connect you with the, the team and, uh, and then see what, uh, what there may be to offer uh, that would be of interest. So Thanks everyone, very good. And glad everybody made it back from Thanksgiving full of turkey. And uh, thank you uh, for, for this excellent presentation. And we will see everyone back then next Wednesday at the same time at noon. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks so much.